Today's webinar is titled EMS in the 20th Century, presented by Derek Fleury. I'm going to pass it over now to our presenter. Derek, thank you so much for being here with us to share your knowledge and experience with us, and we look forward to the presentation. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, before we get started, I guess I'll just kind of introduce myself real quick. Um, so I, I worked uh, the road as a paramedic, uh, as a supervisor, um, instructor for many years before coming to the state of Michigan EMS office. I'm currently the agency licensing coordinator. Uh, I've been here since 2016. Um, I was still pulling shifts on the road uh, up until COVID. Um, I kind of haven't been back since at, at this point. I'm not sure if I will make it into the back of an ambulance professionally again. Um, so I'm gonna kind of start sharing my screen here. So um, this is part two of a presentation. Uh, the previous one is on the YouTube channel, I believe, if, uh, if you did not catch it or if you'd like to watch it again. Um, not a big deal if you haven't caught the first part. Um, we can jump right in. Um, you know, these presentations come from a, a place of interest, basically, of just books I was reading and a lot of uh, knowledge and insight I really hadn't gained um, from anywhere else or heard about. So just wanted to kind of put it all in one place and uh, was able to, to share it to, for everybody. So um, a few of the books that I used or that I read to kind of put this together. Uh, the first one, it's called The Ambulance. Um, this is probably the, the best overall book. Um, if somebody was to ask me if I could recommend one book, you know, on the history of, of ambulance or the EMS, um, this is probably the one I would recommend. Um, gives a really great history, really from ancient times um, up into the present. Um, it's done very well. Um, this is called uh, Ambulance Number 10, Personal Letters from the Front. This is a collection of letters from the First World War from ambulance drivers that were sent back home. Uh, so it's really interesting to hear um, firsthand accounts from people in their own words. Um, so they're letters. Um, it wasn't, they weren't writing them with the intent of them to be published um, or for an audience, you know, it was, it was addressed to somebody specifically in their family or friends. Um, but um, so it's really interesting to read. Um, they were published in the war kind of um, for a couple of reasons. One of them kind of a, almost like a propaganda type of thing uh, to, to really get, get interest, um, to really get support for uh, Americans behind the war. And there wasn't a lot of news um, coming about the war. So people um, were reading it for a couple of different reasons. Uh, this book, Gentlemen Volunteers, really gives a detailed history of the uh, American ambulance drivers in World War I. This book, uh, Beofield Medicine, it, it's more of a, uh, I would say, like a textbook. Um, not as many personal accounts, um, a lot of facts and figures, um, but um, really well done. And this book um, talks about Ernest Hemingway and his friend uh, Das Passos, who were both ambulance drivers in the war um, and would later meet um, and um, would kind of bond their friendship over the fact they were both ambulance drivers. And of course, uh, the American Sirens book by Kevin Hazard. And then this book, uh, Stephen Ambrose, um, Really, there's only one chapter specifically that deals with um, battlefield medics in World War II and other doctors, um, but really a really good resource. Um, just kind of a real, real basic overview from the first presentation, um, kind of looked at the way EMS developed from ancient times um, up into the modern. So we looked at the first documented accounts of soldiers specifically moving patients during a battle, um, which was in the sixth century. Um, it was documented in a book called The Strategic Con, developed by the Byzantines. Um, basically, it was a warrior's encyclopedia. It was very meticulous and basically a who's who of the world and their fighting styles. Um, so really, there's a, a reference to medical corpsmen who would pick up wounded 
um, soldiers during the war with special stirrups and carry them back. Um, and these riders would receive one good gold coin for each man they saved. So it's the first documented account of military, military people specifically moving patients um, during battle. Um, the first civilians um, that were moving paper that we can find documentation of um, was the Brothers of Mercy. Um, and that was in the seventh century. Then the first true ambulance um, was by the French during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, basically they adapted their artillery wagons to move patients. And then the ambulances in the Civil War and how they were utilized and um, then that would carry over um, after the war into civilian life. Um, after the Civil War, there's a um, big industrial cities start seeing the need for ambulances and they start being implemented. Uh, the first being Bellevue Hospital in New York City. And then uh, by the early 1900s, we start seeing the motorized ambulance. Uh, this is the first one. This is the Cunningham Ambulance. So in anticipation um, of things to come, um, governments realized that in future battles, they would need ambulances to move people. So the first time there's a forethought in planning of how to move the wounded in, in future um, battles. Um, so it no longer be an afterthought. Um, so they produce this formula to help anticipate the needs, but um, planning and implement implementation are two different things. So uh, before World War I, it was estimated that around 9% of troops would require transportation in future battles. And then when World, World War I started, um, so it's a, it's a big point of transition, not just for the ambulance, but the world in general. The old horsepower world is transitioning to a mechanical one. Um, not to give a full history lesson, but it's important to realize how the war impacted everything, not just the number of nations that are battling each other, um, but how warfare itself is conducted. Uh, many people thought the war would end fast, but with the new technology, Technology being used, um, it quickly turned into a stalemate. Uh, the old world of horse, horses and single shot weapons were transformed into tanks and machine guns. Uh, trench warfare is what resulted in this. It's something that never had happened before. Uh, battle lines were fortified and there's a little movement from either side. Uh, these soldiers would eat, sleep, fight and die in these trenches. Uh, they were filled with rats and disease. Um, not a great place to be. This is just kind of an overview of uh, what a trench would look like. So shelling from huge guns would soften an enemy position and soldiers would attempt to take over the enemy territory. Uh, the area between the trenches were, was known as no man's land. It was a, a desolate destroyed area where most of the dying took place. Uh, it was hard, if not impossible, to rescue men who fell during a retreat. Uh, they'd be left for a hopeful, merciful death by the enemy. And best of times, there was a camaraderie between both sides that would divide no man's land and the handling, handing over of information uh, to the other side for the wounded. Um, so I'm going to read just a quick firsthand account of uh, what it was like there. So an armistice granted on May 24th, 1915 allowed both sides to bury their dead and collect their wounded. The areas in front of the parapets had become breeding grounds for blowflies and nauseating source of discomfort to the defenders a few yards away. Wounded who had been lying in the open for three days were infested with maggots. In other areas where opposing trenches were only a few yards apart, with numerous machine guns trained on the enemy dead to discourage burying parties. Sanitary corpsmen resorted to grappling irons flung from relative safety of trenches to drag the dead and decomposing bodies away for burial. Uh, 
Within the complications of battle, clearing the dead and wounded from the trenches in no man's land became a nightmare spectacle. Following the first day's Battle of the Somme on July 1st, 1916, stretcher bearers needed three days to clear the battle zone for of more than 57,000 dead and wounded officers and men of the British Army and nearly 6,000 Germans. As many as 10,000 of the first day's wounded remained in the battle zone the following day, half of whom had not yet been accepted by a medical unit. Even after the rescue, however, the wounded continued to suffer hardships. By the time surgeons could attend even minor wounds, the onset of gangrene necessitated, necessitated life-saving amputations to circumvent infection. Uh, the nature of wounds themselves changed um, during the war. Rifled bore barrels added spin to bullets, which were now rounded, pointed, and elongated. This created a greater velocity. It also meant smaller entrance and exit wounds, but greater tissue damage surrounding from the kinetic energy of the bullet. Uh, another new dimension of the war was the use of chemical weapons. Uh, before gas masks were available, soldiers would basically use whatever they could to try to stop the chemicals. Um, when mustard gas was used, it was it was not having it wouldn't have an immediate effect. It would show up in between three and twelve hours later, and it would remain dangerous for weeks. So it made it very hard to decontaminate the ambulances. Uh, the craters that were left from explosions would collect mud, dead gas, body parts, and all kinds of other things. Uh, most wounds were infected by standing water, lice, garbage, human and animal feces. Uh, bandages did little but stopped the bleeding. They were first stabilized and triaged at a field hospital. Soldiers' care was documented in a pay book. Um, this included meds and wounds. Uh, they would then be transported by ambulance to the hospital. In France, facilities were 24 to 36 hours uh, away from the firing line. The casualty clearing station is where most of the surgical process took place. Uh, it was discovered that if dead and injured tissue was removed within 30 hours of damage, sepsis and gangrene could be mitigated. Uh, when the war started, the French had horse-drawn wagons that had not been updated since the 1880s. Uh, the French could not get their hands on automobiles, uh, which so it's kind of ironic. So you have the French who initially um, had pioneered the use of an ambulance in the military um, during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and they, they weren't able to evolve fast enough, um, and they're still stuck in that, that old way um, without the automobiles. Um, so they're still basically using the same system um, from the 1800s. Uh, you'd have stretcher bearers that would go out at night to collect the wounded from no man's land, um, and they were very easy targets. The pre-war idea of protecting medical units under the Red Cross flag was lost. Some would remove their white flags to be harder to see. It would take over an hour for a round trip of a thousand yards. They would have to know the train and have a knowledge and develop a strategy while moving. Uh, they would also have to know the flow of trenches, which way troops and munitions were headed. Um, they would utilize canvas slings or wooden chair. Americans began volunteering as ambulance drivers. Um, it was the only way they could get into the battlefront uh, before America technically entered the war. Uh, France would not let foreigners serve on the front lines as combatants because uh, of concerns they were not loyal to France. Uh, many of those that had come from America had been to Europe before. Um, some wanted to serve and protect the interests of France and England. Some felt there was a historical debt to France or Amer for American independence. Some just wanted adventure or the allure of war called them. Others were helping because of an ethical belief. Most of the volunteers came from Ivy League schools such as Yale, Harvard, or other universities. Uh, some schools let their students volunteer with no penalty. Um, then again, maybe this quote sums up many of their thoughts. When asked, why are you volunteering? Quote, damn if I know. Uh, another person asked a driver about his profession in private life. And quote, I have never done much of anything, sir, up to the present. But I doubt when the war is over, whether I shall ever be happy doing anything again or doing that again. Uh, there's no reporters on the front lines, so letters from the drivers were important, um, like the, the book, um, Letters from the Front, that I showed at the beginning of the presentation. Um, the drivers' reflections were more upbeat than those in the trenches. 
Um, so, quote, for the American ambulance driver, little was ambiguous. He seldom, if ever, had cause to question the sanctity of his work or its intrinsic wor worthiness. Um, so unlike um, people serving in the trenches who, um, you know, may have, may have questioned what they're doing there and uh, had, you know, him to live in those dirty, dirty, infected trenches and fight, um, at least the ambulance drivers uh, felt like they were contributing something. So I'm going to you know, see one here bandaging someone up. And then if you look to the left, um, you see a, a soldier with a look on his face. So I was kind of go up close. So that's the look of a shell shocked soldier. Um, that's something new uh, during World War I. Um, really just the, the, the madness of war um, really getting to people. I think uh, just looking at that guy's face tells a, a huge story. Uh, the volunteers would have to pay for their own travel expenses and uniforms. Um, they did get paid, but it was not very much. Um, the automobile itself was a symbol of America um, and that America would be coming to help. Uh, there's not nearly as many autos in Europe. Uh, France and Britain asked for donations, but people were reluctant to give up their personal vehicles. So Americans came over with their own. Um, drivers would pick up the wounded, as many as they could fit into the truck. Uh, there were no attendants in the back. Sometimes there'd be two drivers to help navigate the dark, crater-filled roads. Uh, the drivers would get them to the field hospital for surgery and stabilization. There were also transfers from hospital to hospital. Uh, many vehicles were used at first, but the best was the Model T, and it, it soon became the vehicle of choice because of its ability and, and standardization. Um, what is a bit unfortunate is the fact that Ford offered no discount uh, when selling the ambulances. Um, he charged full retail price and would not even lower it to the, the dealer price. So basically, it would cost $1,600 at that uh, time. Um, and they built um, almost 6,000 ambulances for the Allies during World War. Uh, this is a picture of the River Rouge plant in uh, Detroit. Uh, they still make uh, vehicles on that gr those grounds. Um, so motorized ambulances, they carried a few supplies. They had blankets, splints, water, um, really tried to keep it as minimal as possible for weight and space. Um, they had to make sure they had low gears to get through the mud and the terrain. Um, once again, that's why the Ford was the vehicle of choice because it's lightness, ground clearance, engine power, um, and the number of patients could take. It could take three or three or five lying down um, and up to seven or eight if they were sitting. And the Model T could reach up to 55 miles per hour, but cruising speed was 30. Um, they also had to carry uh, various mechanical parts, uh, extra spark plugs, tire chalk, chains, rope. Um, they had a steel envelope carrying the papers, uh, their orders for movement, extra inner tubes, um, gas, oil, kerosene, spare tire. So they did have mechanics that would make major repairs, but most of the drivers took care of the maintenance. Um, there's a lot of diaries that mention you know, problems with this tires or spark plugs and the timing device. So imagine having to stop and change a spark plug while you're getting shelled on some dark, muddy path that, uh, you know, probably would not even call it a road. Uh, there's no gas pedal in the Model T uh, to deliver the spark and administer gas. Um, basically just had uh, some levers. Um, the boxes themselves could be modified from canvas to wood. Uh, There's no glass because it was dangerous. Um, you know, like I said, the conditions of the road were filled with uh, all kinds of stuff, body parts uh, from soldiers and horses. Um, the ambulances them themselves smelled horrible from the dried blood. Uh, the ambulance drivers also had to learn the rhythm of artillery. Uh, they knew how long a barrage would last and how long it took to reload. And then they could move their or plan their movements accordingly. And since the artillery could be fired from miles away, it would increase the distance that the ambulances would have to stage. Uh, this is Richard Nelville Hall. Uh, who was 21 years old. He was the first ambulance driver to die. Uh, so I'm going to read just uh, another 
passage here from uh, the book on from the gentleman volunteers. Richard Nelville Hall, 21, the son of a University of Michigan professor and recent graduate of Dartmouth College, was killed about 2 a.m. Christmas Day. His car was struck by a shell. Um, his body was found by Robert Matter at 4 a.m. Matter first spotted an unidentified crumbled mass about 40 feet down a steep ravine. It turned out to be an ambulance. Its chassis hopelessly twisted and roof and spare tires blown into a treetop. Further inspection revealed that the car belonged to Richard Hall, whose body matter found a few feet away, lying on its side, the hands raised as if they were still grasping the steering wheel. Death had been instantaneous. It is said that while matter was investigating the scene, Hall's brother, Lewis, stopped to offer assistance. Reluctant at that point to give Lewis the news of his brother's death, matter quickly assured him that he was merely stopping to attend his brakes and Lewis drove on. Matter and fellow driver Alan Jennings brought the body back, and on December 26th, a funeral ceremony was held in a small Protestant chapel. <clears throat> the gravestone inscription was direct and simple. It read, Richard Hall, an American who died for France. Hall was the first American volunteer ambulance driver to die in the war. Um, there are also some letters that he sent home um, to his parents that are documented. Um, at that time. Here's an actual picture of his uh, grave site. So if you're ever in France, you can go and find that. Um, at the University of Michigan, enough students, alumni, and faculty enlisted into the Ambulance Army Corps to, Corps to form three separate divisions. Um, being from Michigan, I, they do have uh, some quite a few references to specifically Michigan in here. Um, some drivers did make it back. Here's just an article uh, for, from uh, a couple of people that uh, were ambulance drivers that, that made it back to Michigan after the war. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, um, probably the most famous ambulance driver of World War I. Um, to, and to quote him, he says, I will go not because of any love of gold or glory, etc., but because I could not face anybody after the war and not have been in it. <clears throat> uh, once he arrived, he was bored. Um, there wasn't enough for him to do at the time. Um, so he volunteered to bicycle to the front to deliver chocolate and cigarettes. Um, a motor exploded while leaning against a wall. Um, so it's claimed that he carried a wounded man on his back and he was shot by a machine gun. Um, there's lots of mystery surrounding what happened, um, possibly part myth, uh, maybe part propaganda. Um, he would recuperate and return to America as a war hero. He would carry shrapnel from the war in his body for the rest of his life. So he actually was over there for a very short period of time um, and didn't really transport many patients um, in the ambulance. Um, he did spend some time in the hospital and it would influence his book, A Farewell to Arms, while he was um, over there. Um, his nurse told him she would come to America to marry him, but she ended up getting engaged to a French officer. Um, John Despasos, he was another um, writer that was um, a volunteer ambulance driver. Um, he kind of had a different perspective. He really hated the idea of war. He was a pacifist. Um, he was a big non-interventionalist. Um, so it's something to consider that most Americans uh, were actually opposed to joining the war at first. And like I said, later in life, uh, the two of them would become friends. Uh, There's quite a few uh, writers um, that were ambulance drivers at the time. <clears throat> um, this is E. Cummings. Um, once again, he was pretty pretty anti-war while he was over there. Um, and in his letters that he sent back um, were read, and he was actually detained and questioned um, about his loyalty to the to the war. Uh, uh, this is Sergeant Stubby. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, there, there's many dogs and animals that helped out uh, with with rescuing people and saving people uh, during the World War. Um, so Sergeant Stubby is one of them. So uh, I won't go into details, but you should look him up. Um, I'm going to skip this. Basically, this is some footage of um, the American ambulance drivers in France. 
<clears throat> so after the war, um, things remain the same back here in the States. Uh, the ambulance services continued to operate in much the same way as before the war. The only difference was that the horses were being phased out completely. Uh, just like with everything else, motor cars were becoming the preferred mode of transportation. Uh, in 1924, the stables at Bellevue closed. The last horses, Joe and Jim, that were stable mates for 20 years were shipped upstate uh, to graze until they died. Uh, which was a better fate than their driver, John O'Neill, who, be who, because he was unfit to drive, was forced to leave Bellevue and work as a common laborer. So we start seeing um, more modern-looking ambulances uh, here. This is one from Detroit in 1927. This is actually the first uh, ambulance uh, in Det for Detroit the fire department. I'm, gonna, I'm not sure if I can share this video or not, but I'm going to attempt it. Oh, I'm sorry for the, sorry for the ad, I apologize. Okay, so yeah, pretty neat. They actually found that ambulance and was able to uh, restore it and uh, still around. Um, by the 1930s, uh, private auto ambulances were common in almost every moderate and large U.S. cities. Um, in markets that hospitals had previously ran, the ambulance services were getting out of the business and turning things over to private services. Um, in some cases, this led to a decrease in quality, uh, especially in areas with no regulation. Um, ambulances are starting to enter uh, the culture all over um, and become more common, um, as can be seen by this children's toy ambulance. Limo services and other car rentals realized they could offer luxury non-emergent transports, um, and that in turn hurt the hospital's bottom line in regarding um, them transporting. Um, even service stations beginning begin getting into the ambulance business. Every area and city of the country was a little different. Uh, some municipalities ran rescue, some had ambulances, um, still very little regulation anywhere. Um, 
just a couple pictures of some some different ambulances from the era era. Um, I see lights on that one. Um, I thought this was interesting just because it says serving Louisville and all surrounding communities within a thousand mile radius. Uh, those are some some long transports. So not much is uh, changing in regards to care and transport. Um, still basically no regulation and it's just leaving individual communities and hospitals to figure out how they want to move people. Um, and then World War II starts. Um, here is the Dodge WC-54 ambulance. Uh, it was produced from 1942 to 1944. It was the standard U.S. ambulance. So if you ever see old movies or, or TV shows like MASH or anything like that, that, that is the, the ambulance they're using. Um, they had roof-mounted slings and folding bench seating, um, which provided room for four stretchers or up to six patients. Um, it was a uh, four-wheel drive, um, weighed about... 6,000 pounds, and they made over 23,000 of these. So once again, it's just kind of like the, the iconic picture of a, a military ambulance. And then for the first time, you have standardized markings and spe uh, specifications. So they're, they're all looking the same. They're all built to the same standard. Um, and everybody kind of had their own version um, during the war. War. This is like a, a Ford reproduction of Soviet ambulance, um, Italian ambulances, uh, ambulances with tank tracks. Uh, a lot of these vehicles would be used long after the war, even to the into the nineteen eighties, um, and could be used as camper vans and things like that. Once again, just little mini tank ambulance. Then you have the, the classic Jeep, which uh, you could throw a patient on top um, and transport them if needed. So during World War II, 85% of soldiers who had emergency surgery in a field hospital survived, which is a, a great improvement uh, from the Civil War, which was around 50%. Um, you'd have one medic per platoon, um, around, uh, you know, around a few dozen men, basically. Many people chose to become medics because of religious reasons. Uh, volunteers were often hard to find. Some medics changed their minds and became soldiers after seeing uh, the war firsthand. Uh, they all had the training of infantrymen except for weapons. Uh, they were sectioned off from the soldiers during training. Uh, there was much animosity between the medics and infantrymen during training, but that would change once they were deployed on the front lines and the medics were saving people's lives. Uh, they would be called the bravest men other soldiers ever encountered. To preserve their non-combatant status under the Geneva Convention, they did not receive combat pay. Other soldiers would chip in and take up collections for them. Uh, they could not wear the infantryman badge, but were eligible for other awards, such as the Medal of Honor. Typical care would be for the medic to reach a wounded man, possibly under gunfire, give a brief assessment, uh, put on a tourniquet, inject morphine, clean the wound, sprinkle, sprinkle sulfa powder, uh, which was an antibacterial procedure, um, bandage the wound and carry the patient towards the rear of the battle line. Germans and Americans most of the time respected the role of medics and would not fire on them. Uh, this caused an increased visibility on armbands and helmets. Uh, so unlike World War I, where people were you know, taking off their insignia um, in World War II, um, they wanted to be much more visible because most of the time uh, the other sides would respect that and, and not shoot at the medics. So I'm going to read uh, one more uh, account here from the book Citizen Soldier. Robert Bradley was an aide man with the 30th Infantry Division. He had been a medical student before the war, a religious man. He preferred to save rather than to kill. He went to Omaha Beach on June 10th. He slept along a hedgerow. Starting at dawn through to the end of the war, 
he set about saving lives. His instruments were crude. He tied scissors to one of his wrists with a shoestring in order to have them handy to cut away bloody clothing. He carried extra comp compresses in his gas mask container. His raincoat had many patches cut out of the tail because he had learned to slap a piece of raincoat on a sucking chest wound, then cover it with a compress. In Normandy, Bradley learned how to get to his patients in a hurry. In basic training, he had detested learning to turn somersaults, but he found that the best way to go over a hedgerow was in a dive head first. Then he would dash to the wounded man in the open field, a man who had been abandoned and who was utterly dependent on the medic. Bradley remembered the unspeakable light of hope in the eyes of the wounded as we popped over a hedgerow. So after, after they were off the battlefield and transported by ambulance, they'd be treated at a nearby field hospital. If needed, they would be transferred back to England. Um, this is just another YouTube clip of uh, the American Field Services in World War II. Um, I do want to talk about Waverly B. Woodson Jr. Um, while he was in training, his superiors informed him that his anti-craft artillery he was assigned to could not take him because of his race. He was then sent to medic training and assigned to the all-black 320th Anti-Craft Barrage Balloon Battalion. <clears throat> During D-Day, the storming of Normandy, Woodson received shrapnel wounds to his buttocks and inner thigh. He treated his own wounds and continued on to Omaha Beach to help the countless wounded. Woodson set up a medical aid station using the cover of Rocky Embankment to shield himself from German machine gun fire. He spent the next 30 hours there treating the wounded and dying on Omaha Beach. At that point, suffering from blood loss and pure exhaustion, he collapsed. He was transferred to a hospital where he recuperated for three days before requesting the return to the beach and treat more soldiers. Uh, he was interviewed um, and basically was, was cited by his commanding officer for extraordinary bravery on D-Day. So after the war, um, the modern ambulance services are becoming more expensive back home. Um, hospital admissions are steadily on the rise. Hospitals have less interns they can send out on ambulances and still no standards or regulation. So just some different advertisements, taxi cab service slash ambulance, ice cream truck looking ambulance. Uh, this is a picture from Universal Ambulance here in Michigan. They've been around since the 50s. This is a picture on their website. Um, so it's just interesting to kind of see the, the evolution and the fact they're still around um, is, is uh, quite an accomplishment. Uh, services are basically left to whoever could try and turn a profit. Um, in 1955, only 16% of hospitals provided ambulances. When hospitals go out of business, uh, the replacements were not trained very well. Um, they had inferior equipment. Um, and as cars are becoming more popular and widespread, uh, there's leading to the increase in trauma. In 1955, there's a survey of 46 cities and they show only one third of them were totally private ambulance services. Then you have my favorite ambulance uh, from childhood and, and probably till today. Um, in 1965, 22 percent of municipalities regulated ambulances. So um, you only have 8 percent, 72 out of 900 required Red Cross training. Um, then we get to the, the white paper, the 1966 Accidental Death and Disability, the Neglected Disease of Modern Medicine. So you'll typically get a reference in a, a short paragraph or something like that in your textbooks um, talking about this. At the time, accidents are the leading cause of death for those under 37 and the fourth leading cause of death overall. So finally, finally uh, everybody's realizing what a huge problem uh, they have or that we have collectively. Um, people are dying um, really unnecessarily. So uh, starting to try and, and figure out something to do about that. And once again, you know, people are realizing that a, a soldier shot in Vietnam has a better chance of survival than someone seriously injured on an American highway. So the uh, first steps 
of trying to put piece something together for standardization is because starting. So we're going to start seeing some, maybe some familiar names, some pioneers. Um, you have Dr. Joseph Deke Farrington um, in 1963 began teaching uh, advanced practical courses in uh, emergency aid and transportation of the criti critical ill to the Chicago Fire Department. In 1967, he publishes Death in a Ditch, which might be the best name of a book ever. And then in 1968, uh, the College of Surgeons with Farrington as the chairman uh, put out this uh, training document. Then in 1971, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons published the first edition of Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured and created the backbone of EMS education. Um, there's still updated educations being used today. Um, Peter Safar, father of CPR in the ICU. Um, he's, he's such a character. I just want to give a brief overview of, of kind of his life and how, how he came into the position that he was in. Um, he was born in 1924. Uh, both of his parents were doctors. In 1938, uh, living in Vienna, the Nazis invade. <clears throat> In 42, he was drafted into the army, but was but caught a rash from his uniform that kept him out of service. Um, and after that, friendly doctors would keep him on patient rolls, juggling him from one hospital to another, trying to um, trying to keep him out of the military from serving with the Nazis. Um, finally, he was caught um, at a hospital, and, and they were there to, to look at him, and he smeared some kind of caustic ointment that caused such a severe allergic reaction that they finally just discharged him and said he was unfit for service. Um, he continued to work in Vienna uh, at the hospitals during the occupation. Um, in 48, he graduated medical school, um, and then in 49, um, he was at Yale and became an anesthesiologist. So as an anesthesiologist, he would test these gases on himself, trying to improve um, um, his, his craft. Um, he was certain there was a better form of resuscitation than the back pressure arm lift method, which is, is shown here. Um, you know, I guess the, the idea is you're trying to trying to move air out of people's lungs somehow by doing this motion. Um, so he started using sedated, paralyzed volunteers to, to prove mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation worked. Um, they were paid $150. As far as wife was also used. Um, sometimes you'd use Boy Scouts as young as 10 uh, to keep these patients alive. And sometimes these rescuers were not told how to even perform CPR until the last moment. Um, you'd give presentations, um, and the military finally agreed uh, to financially back him. Um, and then the, um, basically with the addition of chest compressions and the mouth to mouth, he created basic life support CPR. And then he would help train Baltimore firefighters in this. Uh, by 1966, CPR is being taught to medical professions and lay people. Uh, in 1966, Safar's own daughter suffers an asthma attack. Um, he finds her unresponsive without a, without a pulse. He begins CPR. Uh, pulses are gained, but she would have brain damage from the lack of oxygen. Um, so now we're going to start discussion. Start the discussion on the first on the country's first paramedics, uh, Freedom House in Pittsburgh, and kind of the events that led up to its creation. Um, if you have not read the book, American Sirens by Kevin Hazard, please do so. Um, it's a great book, not just for EMS professionals, but for everyone. So in November 4th, 1966, you have uh, David Lawrence, who was the ex-governor of Pennsylvania, speaking at an event, a political rally with over 2,500 people, and he collapsed. So um, at this point in time, he's probably the biggest uh, political figure in the entire state. Um, a nurse there uh, pushes her way through the crowd and begins to administer rescue breaths. Uh, the police ambulance arrives, which is just two basically officers in a wagon. Um, they shove the nurse aside, uh, throw him on the stretcher. Uh, the nurse forces her way back um, with them and actually jumps in the back of the wagon while both the police officers ride up front on the way to the hospital. 
Uh, so far as they're waiting at the hospital when they arrive, um, they start CPR, um, they get a heartbeat, uh, but the lack of initial medical care left him brain dead. He's believed to be the first person to be removed from life support. So now Safar has the proof and justification he needs to, to really push for an EMS system. Um, so it kind of took a really big event that was publicized in the papers uh, for everybody to collectively recognize that there was a need. Mm. So then you also have a man named Phil Har Harlan, I'm sorry, Phil Hallen, uh, arrived in Pittsburgh working towards a PhD in English and um, working part-time as an orderly, eventually becomes an ambulance driver and is amazed what he saw and, and what he didn't see um, on the ambulance. Um, he enrolls at Yale uh, for public health. So basically Pittsburgh has a, a police problem. There's these wagons with police officers showing up and or not showing up sometimes, um, and at the at the best, throwing people in the back and just driving to the hospital. And a part of Pittsburgh um, that was particularly neglected was called the Hill. Um, it's situated on the slopes above downtown Pittsburgh. Um, was after the Revolutionary War, free slaves came to Pittsburgh from Virginia uh, and became a destination for many immigrants. Um, by the early 1900s, it's predominantly African American. So in the late 60s, Halen is really dismayed at the lack of service in the hill. So basically he starts looking for a way and an infrastructure to create it. Um, but he realized that it needed to be an African-American operation. So basically he found Freedom House, um, which already existed, um, which fostered black owned businesses. Um, it was founded by and ran by James McCoy Jr., a civil rights activist. Um, so Halen basically figures that if they can sell produce out of the back of a truck, um, they can and they can move food. Why can't they move people? So the, the two of them are opposites, but work together to create Freedom House. So like I said, as far as been trying to get EMS started in Pittsburgh um, since he moved there and finally has the, the opportune time to do it. Um, but, you know, nobody in Pittsburgh is interested. Um, he wanted to bring the ER to the patient. So Freedom House and Halen um, thought they could do it, but they insisted all the recruits would be black. Um, you know, training consisted of CPR, advanced first aid, driving, medical ethics, legalities, recognizing arrhythmias, IVs, uh, ministering drugs, um, treating diabetics, overdoses, uh, DIBs. Um, so initially training took 172 hours. Um, they would spend a week at the morgue and Safar was intent on them learning intubation. Uh, in 1968, they get their first call. It's a seizure. Um, their patients transported without incident. Uh, there's so much available now. I don't really want to tell these men and women's stories. Um, they can do that in themselves through the books, and there's lots of online resources. But I just want to emphasize that this is an American story. It's not just about EMS and EMS providers, but really it's an American experience. And it's about helping others. It's about individuals helping themselves um, despite obstacles they face. It's about racism. It's about political corruption. Um, by 1972, Freedom House has 35 crew members. Uh, Nancy Carolyn would give medical direction starting in 1975. Uh, emphasis on being a professional. If there's one thing personally I took away from the Freedom House story, it was the constant remarks of being professional. And if somehow these paramedics could themselves be professional, it would force everyone else to have to treat them that way. Um, that's just a link to the uh, little mini PBS uh, documentary on Freedom House. If you haven't made it through the book or you want a little shorter little visual um, uh, feedback, that's a way to go. Um, so in the 60s, you get some other ambulance services to start doing Ellis Carey of Bucks Ambulance Mobile Coronary Unit uh, with drivers and RNs and begin training EMS riders in some cardiology. They had a successful save in 1969. Their story with an emphasis on the first female paramedics is the subject of a documentary called The Rose City Experiment. Um, you can watch that on Amazon. Uh, this is Miami's first ALS unit. 
here is King County, Seattle. Um, so like in all these early places, they had one thing in common. Um, it took a dedicated, passionate doctor uh, who knew that lives could be saved by training paramedics and, and really pushing and advocating for it. So I'm going to talk about Chicago. I'm going to kind of use them as an example. Um, I'm going to pick on them here a little bit. Uh, so just kind of a, a history of EMS in the city of Chicago. So Chicago police serves ambulances until 1922. Oops, I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, then they moved to private outfits. In 1933, city council approves a splint ordinance requiring ambulance equipment and training. Uh, the contagious disease division was in charge of enforcement, but really that did not happen. Uh, at that time, hospitals sold their ambulances. They signed contracts with independent private agencies or just did without them. Um, in 1949, these unreliable private firms um, give way to the police moving patients again. Um, and the police was exempt from the Splint Ordinance, so they did not require any training. Um, in 1954, they have a total of 80 police wagons moving patients. Um, even if the, as the fire department there started buying ambulances, um, they wouldn't be dispatched because they weren't police. And then in 1954, less than 6% of patients arrived by ambulance to the hospital. Then in 1970, uh, a group of news stories came out um, that ended up winning a, a Pulitzer Surprise. So you have a, a Tribune reporter and another investigator um, going in and working for these different private agencies. And really what they describe and, and what they observe, observe is, is what they quote, the most sickening display of mistreatment human beings I've ever witnessed. So just a little uh, excerpt from one of their articles. I leaped from the vehicle, my heart pounding. It was my first day on the job as an ambulance attendant, my first emergency call. I had good reason to be nervous. Reporting for work less than an hour before, I was immediately assigned to an ambulance. Now, with no training in the handling of a stretcher or the use of oxygen, I was to be confronted with a reported heart attack victim who could be fighting for her life. The city code requires only first aid training to be licensed as an attendant. It was the first and would quickly become a long list of horror stories involving the misery versions who operate some of Chicago's private ambulance companies. So basically, he had a, a whole two-month investigation. Um, in, in reading more and more of these, the, from like just the articles, it's uh, pretty, pretty intense. Um, so that took uh, enough public outcry with this being brought to life for for reform um, in the city of Chicago. Um, looking back and trying to gather things personally, um, sometimes it's really hard, you know, things get lost in history, records get destroyed. Uh, it's hard to remember why things were even done. Um, you know, just trying to, in my, my home city, like trying to go back and find the, the origins of, uh, the ambulance service or ALS or BLS coverage, there isn't a whole lot there. You know, sometimes I think it really takes actual, like, historian work, you know, either going to, to libraries or, or digging through archives to really try and, and find that. Um, this is just kind of an example. I, I found this in the Michigan office. This was a, a checklist from 1971, uh, technically even before we started regulating ambulances or the, the law that we currently use. So it's just very interesting to, to see what was required um, back in 1971. Uh, Detroit EMS does start in May of 1972. Uh, I'm going to try to get through these last few slides real quick. I'd like to show one last video before this gets over. Um, emergency, the TV show comes out in 72, which is important because it really kind of brings the perception, or not the perception, but yeah, the perception of what people think they're entitled to at, for emergency care. If they're seeing people on TV receive a certain standard, they kind of start asking why they're not receiving that, that standard of care. Uh, it's just a picture from here in Michigan, a, a rural county that uh, sheriff's department that uh, started uh, doing ambulance uh, transports in the 70s. Uh, in 74, you start getting the actual requirements for the triple K ambulance standards. Uh, which are used uh, if ambulances are being purchased using federal funds. And that is just a sticker. Um, and these are states and what their current ambulance standards are. Uh, the red states um, currently have no standards that I'm aware of. 
1971. You have the NREMT um, for basics in 1978. You start getting uh, the first registry test uh, for paramedicine. And then here in Michigan, this is our, our law, our public health code, which was enacted in 1978. So all our licensing and regulation uh, comes from that. So as someone who's worked in, in the EMS section for the state government, uh, it can be hard to comprehend the intent with many parts of the law. I would love to have some notes or rationale behind some of the things that were put in there at that time. But once again, it's just kind of lost to history. All right, uh, I'm gonna try and show this short video real quick while we still have a couple minutes left. Um, it's just it's just really cool to, to see. It's from the early 70s. Um, so I'll try to watch this. All right. So yeah, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, resources, uh, please send them my way. And uh, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Derek, for such an informative part two of this presentation. Um, like Derek mentioned earlier, I will um, include the link to the part one of this um, in tomorrow's follow-up email. And I will also paste the link for CE in the chat here, and I will leave that up for a minute or two so you can grab that link. Um, but if you miss that, it will also be in tomorrow's follow-up email. So thank you all so much, and we will see you all next time. And there is that CE link for you in the chat. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. And also, I will be sure to put your contact information in the follow-up email as well um, so they can reach out to you with any questions. Sounds good. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.